So. All right, three minutes into it. Um, let's get started. My name is Charles Lee. I am the academic co-director of the Environmental Research Institute to Tumufakawa Tayel at the University of Waikato. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Professor Emily Bernhardt from Duke University to give a talk. So Professor Bernhardt is the James B. Duke Distinguished Professor at Duke University, and she's part of the Nicholas School of the Environment. And she's here um, as a Fulbright Specialist. So this is basically a, 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 a visit facilitated by the Fulbright Foundation. Um, and with a particular focus on working with freshwater researchers and reviewing the workshop report of the Te Waikato Symposium that we held jointly with um, the Waikato Regional Council and Waikato River Authority last year. So before I start, I would like to ask my Makonga co-director, Tim Manico, to give us a karakia for the presentation. Oh, Angati Mahanga, um, Angati Tamanga Po, Angati Waidiri. Uh, no, my brother, my, uh, it's me, he do, uh, to Karo, or the Faka Oranga, or Tato Kaio, or Faka Oranga, or Tato Wai, or Otero, um, the Tukunawa or Waikato, Engari, the Hora Te Wai or Te Ao, the Hora Te Tangata or Te Ao. Ah, it's me, Kia, we, um, all right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here for a couple of weeks to learn a lot about a river. Uh, you don't often get the chance to just come and really learn a lot from the book. And I think there's going to be all kinds of interesting things for me to take back home with me um, as I learn about the Bacana. So I want to talk about rivers today, but I am going to be here for a couple of weeks. So I did want to say that I'm not talking today. Let's see. Maybe I'm maybe I'm not doing anything today. Yeah, I'm, I do work on other things, and if folks are interested in talking to me about uh, saltwater intrusion and sea level rise and rural coastal landscapes, I do a lot of that work in North Carolina. Um, I teach a class on climate change that's interdisciplinary together with theologian. I'd love to chat with folks about that. Um, I've done a lot of work on mountaintop removal coal mining um, and gold mining in Peru, and so if you want to talk about mining, I'm interested in that as well. So just so you know, I don't just need to talk about rivers, um, and I'm also um, in, in the midst of a very large project to merge uh, catchment science science records from all over the world to allow population level studies of watershed science. But for today, I want to talk about rivers because that they're my like natal scientific home and I love them so much. Uh, this is a picture of New Hope Creek, which is a stream uh, really close to Duke University and actually the home of the very first ever annual metabolism study done in a river uh, back in the late 1960s by Charlie Hall. I'll come back to that. I think, you know, rivers are amazing systems that we rely on for so many things. You know, they're an important, uh, you know, I think every kid loves rivers. I know I'm probably a river scientist because I love playing in rivers as a kid and pulling up crayfish and pulling up bugs and being excited by them. Uh, they're sort of magical places and we rely on them for ritual and economic activity. Um, and we also um, are changing them rapidly all over the world. I'm really interested in how climate change is impacting rivers, and it's actually kind of hard to study on top of all the other things that we're doing to them. So this is just to remind me to say that we know that river and stream temperatures are increasing. Uh, global ocean temperature increases are getting all the attention, but of course, fresh waters are warming all over the place. Um, this is a nice compilation of USGS records for the United States. Um, we know that uh, the water cycle of the planet is speeding up, and so also river flows are increasing, while at the same time, more rivers are drying, which is a confusing thing to explain to the public, right? But we're getting higher highs and lower lows. Um, and these are sort of more extreme conditions that make it hard to make a living as an aquatic organism. 
these things can be really hard to see in a lot of the rivers that I work on because we're doing all these other things that are even more obvious and more extreme and more acute. Uh, it could be water quality pollution. This is the famous Cuyahoga River in Ohio that was actually went on fire for months because of pollution back in the 60s. Uh, Stormwater pipes, uh, all kinds of channel erosion, sediment pollution, uh, livestock in the stream. So these are the things that we're typically sort of seeing the, the front edge, right? The most obvious edge of what's happening to any river system you might walk into. But at the same time, they're also experiencing climate change. So I've been thinking a lot about how do we study both of these things simultaneously. And I don't have an answer for you, but I'll tell you kinds of the things that I've been learning along the way. I should also say, I have seen all these slides before, and this is a small crowd. So if you want to interrupt me and we want to get into a conversation, that's totally fine. I don't need to get to the end. Okay, so one of my basic questions is thinking about the energetics of rivers, and I'm really proud of this slide. I was able to publish this in the Knowledge and Oceanography without, an, without a y-axis. <laughs> um, it's one of my favorite figures I've ever made, and what is it? It's four years of oxygen traces for four different rivers. Uh, I love it because it tells this super interesting story of four rivers with really different stories, right? You've got the Menominee River in Wisconsin there with this big, strong signal every summer. It's incredibly productive. Uh, you've got this little river in Fano Creek, Oregon, a super shaded stream that's barely doing anything. And this is basically the breath of a river, right? Or I like to think of it as the pulse of a river. And this was sort of early days of the Stream Pulse Project um, that I was part of with a whole cast of amazing folks from across the United States. And this is all the PIs, but there were about uh, 30 grad students associated with this as well over the course of a five-year project. And our goal was like, can we take all these oxygen traces and can we begin collecting oxygen traces and make the measurement, converting that kind of data into energetics of rivers, something that people commonly do as a part of our work. Um, Okay, so, and why, why do that? Why think about energetic regimes? Well, we've spent a lot of time thinking about how rivers are altered in terms of their sort of, in, in, sort of their flow regimes, their thermal regimes. Um, and much of what we think about in terms of river degradation is about those alterations in the physical, these physical processes. So if you thought about rivers at all, you probably thought about the natural flow regime. Uh, Stu, um, Stuart, this is from Stuart Bunn and Ange Angela Arthington huge amount of work on how various um, manipulations of water infrastructure or climate are altering the flow regimes of rivers. So flow regimes are really important for setting the life history of the organisms that live in rivers. They're incredibly important for moving sediments, for actually creating the form and structure of channels. And as we put in dams or as we put in levees or as we change the climate, we alter the timing of floods and droughts and low and high flows in ways that makes it actually quite difficult for the organisms that evolve in those places to sustain their life cycle. Um, so this is one of the major things that we've altered about rivers over time. And then the natural thermal regime, maybe it's not gotten as much attention, but it's also equally important um, as a sort of phenological cues for all kinds of life history and systems, right? And there's lots of cold water fisheries, for example, we're very concerned about as they warm, it's impossible for those fisheries to be sustained. So the same kinds of cues and sort of seasonal temperature regimes are really important. And we're manipulating that just as much uh, by altering not only the climate, but altering the ways water is entering systems and how long water is stored. So we wanted to take these ideas together with light regimes, which receive a lot less attention, but it's obviously a really important driver of the productivity of rivers. And you can think about the fact that light uh, in rivers is, is a function, not just of how much light is getting through the clouds, but also how much light is getting through the canopy, right? And as we manipulate riparian vegetation or manipulate river widths, we also change the light regimes of the system. So if you think about these sort of primary drivers of how rivers work, how the, what the ecosystem sort of working constraints are. It's gonna be the flow regime, the thermal regime, and the light regime sort of set the constraint space in which life has to operate, right? So let's go back to this sort of life operating in four different systems with obviously very different thermal, light, and flow regimes. So we can take these oxygen traces, and of course they're super interesting to look at, but Oxygen profiles in rivers are a function of both the amount of breathing by organisms, right? The production of oxygen by photosynthesizers, the consumption of oxygen by heterotrophs, but also all kinds of complicated physical dynamics. Oxygen being delivered by, from groundwater or oxygen being um, uh, evaded to the atmosphere through atmospheric exchange. And it's complicated to think about that atmospheric exchange of rivers because it's a result of turbulence and uh, surface area and all these things. But the basic unit 
of energetic measurements in rivers is a single day of oxygen. So think about oxygen trace. It typically, gonna, if you have uh, algae or macrophytes in your system, oxygen is going to get high in the middle of the day at solar noon, and it's going to be very low at night when the heterotrophs are active and the autotrophs are not. So this dial amplitude of oxygen can be used to actually calculate the amount of productivity and then estimate the amount of ecosystem respiration and evasion or gas exchange that are occurring in the system. We've known this for a really long time. In fact, uh, whole ecosystem energetic measurements began in rivers with the work of um, Eugene Odo back in the um, late 50s. And early days, super hard. If you wanted to make an oxygen trace in a river from a single day, you had to go out with your gas type bottles and you had to bring those bottles like a lab, you had to do Winkler titrations. And so creating a single day's metabolism, metabolism estimate would probably take you three days of work back in the lab. So this is from Charlie Hall's um, dissertation work back in the late 60s, uh, published in Ecology, a single day's metabolism estimate. And the idea is you get this dial signal, and then you use the sort of day-night thing, just like a dark light bottle incubation, to estimate the whole ecosystem level of productivity. But extremely difficult to do and quite expensive, and so for a very long time, uh, this was only done for a day at a time, and usually on nice days when you wanted to be in the field. Right, so uh, the very first estimates were made by Eugene Odom in the Florida Springs, uh, and then Charlie Hall um, started doing some work um, with Howard Odom as his dissertation advisor. He made measurements using those Winkler titrations uh, multiple times per year. He was the first person to get an actual seasonal pattern of metabolism for a river. This is Newhook Creek in North Carolina. And it's kind of cool. I think the coolest thing about it, let me walk you through it. On the bottom, we've got months of the year. Uh, the, the white shaded area is the productivity, and up above that, you've got the ecosystem respiration. So one thing you can see is that respiration of the system is always higher than productivity, and that's because the river is receiving mm -hmm. lots of organic carbon from the surrounding um, terrestrial environment that's, sub that's subsidizing uh, the energetics of that system. You can see that the peak of productivity in this river is in March. And that's really interesting and actually now we know quite common in deciduous forested rivers that are narrow because during the summer it's actually too shaded for much productivity to occur. So you get this like little narrow window. The water warms up enough and it's bright enough that you get productivity and as soon as the canopy closes you shut that down. You get a second peak of high respiration in the fall and that's not surprising that's because you're getting a huge subsidy of autumn litter fall. Coming in. So this was a really beautiful study of the actual ecosystem phenology of a river done in 1969 and then not again for 30 years. <laughs> um, instead, people didn't want to do Winkler titrations, pain in the ass, sorry. Um, so they waited till we had sensors and initial sensors were, were super expensive. The very first oxygen sensors were going to be about $20,000, $25,000. And so you're going to put that out in the stream only on a nice day when there's not gonna be a storm, right? And you're not gonna leave it out there very long. So people would typically go out and leave their oxygen sensors or sit out with their oxygen sensors, right? For a couple of days and they'd make measurements. And people started to say, oh, well, we're gonna do this all over the place. We're gonna do large scale uh, measurements. And one of the biggest studies to do that um, was from the, the loading intersite nitrate experiment in the United States, which went across 72 different rivers and measured metabolism and used uh, N15 labeled ammonia to measure nitrogen uptake. Super cool study, but the metabolism data that they got in all these different biomes, do you see any patterns here? No, nothing. Like the biomes aren't different from each other. There's just this scatter shot. Each of these points is basically two days of metabolism data, right? And actually, when I just showed you that variability seasonally, right, or those oxygen traces, there's just so much day to day variability in a river that when you take a single day or two days, you have no idea. Does that represent the mean? Does that represent the max? Does that represent the min? You really don't know because we just don't have enough information. We have a single seasonal study in the world to go on. So we had this sort of large scale but short term measurement frequency. And then we started to see a couple more people starting to do these near continuous measurements. The sensors got cheaper. Um, the first two studies, uh, Ois Berlinger in Switzerland and then Ryan Roberts and Pat Mulholland in, in Oak Ridge National Lab in, in Tennessee, um, started to do these beautiful um, annual metabolisms. So the Roberts and all one looks a lot like the New York Creek one. You've got here, again, months of the year, you've got that spring algal peak, you've got nothing happening during the summer, and then you get this big autumn litter fall peak of respiration not accompanied by algal productivity. Very cool deciduous forest system. Ois Berlinger's plot is from a river system downstream of a dam with major hydropower releases. And so that system is 
super bright. It's a big open river that gets massive planned floods. And you get exactly what you might expect under those conditions, right? So every time there's a big bed scouring flood, you knock that productivity back, it recovers, you knock it back, it recovers. So these show us the importance of both light and flow regimes in driving the pattern of productivity in rivers. And, and super interesting, and obviously two very different systems. So now we've got three annual metabolism measures for the entire entirety of rivers of the world. So the goal of the Stream Pulse project was to try to put something in this quadrant of the graph and say, well, can we actually start doing annual continuous metabolism records all over the world um, and use that to actually understand what drives variability in cross systems? So as again, again, coming back to this idea, these are dissolved oxygen concentrations. And I just want to point out <clears throat> that in this trace, you could pick a day in each of these four rivers where their oxygen dial cycle is exactly the same, right? But these are not the same river, right? And so we have, we have, and then we can take those same uh, combination of rivers here. Now I'm picking sort of three different days for each of those rivers. And you can see on their best day and on their worst day, their worst days are all the same. Nothing's happening, right? On their best days, they're quite different. And the frequency of those best days and worst days is quite variable between those different systems. And you can see how important, so now I've converted those uh, oxygen traces into actual estimates of daily metabolism. Uh, for each of these, it's for a 60-day window. And what you can see in each case is the, in the gray, you've got the hydrograph in the background. So you can see that in each case, you've got peak flows that are knocking back your productivity, right? And so that thermal, that, um, that flow regime is gonna be a big constraint on what can happen across systems. So we started off um, our project with sort of these ideas from these long-term oxygen records available from USGS a few examples and saying we think light and flow are the big um, the big drivers so we can we can as we start to do this we can add in a much more um, I think robust way what is the role of rivers in global carbon cycling something people have been interested in for a long time um, and instead of having just point estimates we can actually take lots and lots of individual traces and I'm just going to show you a couple different so we first we, we basically did this for 215 different US rivers which had at least a year of data um, I will say now that data is that data is all published if you want to play with it. And we're just about to publish a new one that's got at least uh, eight to 14 years of data from over um, 50 rivers in the U.S. So you can actually look at long term trends or year to year variability. So from those 215 U.S. rivers, we can now make an estimate of the average productivity of rivers. I realize 215 U.S. river segments is not that many, but it's a whole lot more than three. Right. And so we can, can begin to have annual estimates, not sort of point estimates, which we're extrapolating to a whole year. And we can start to put those numbers um, into global budgets. I think those numbers will probably continue to improve, but probably not a lot. Um, my uh, One of my former mentors, Bill Schlesinger, who um, has done a lot of global carbon cycling work, loves, we taught a class together, and loved to point out that the original estimates of global terrestrial productivity by Leith and Whitaker in the late 50s are within a half a teragram of the modern satellite-based estimates. And those are based on like 50 weather stations around the world and a bunch of biomass uh, removal things. So I think we're going to see, we'll probably refine it, we'll probably understand more about the heterogeneity, but I suspect the numbers are not going to change a lot. Rivers are not uh, major, they're not producing uh, tons of carbon in the system and they are net heterotrophic. That'll be kind of our, our outcome. But we can begin to think about how's that changing? Where is it changing a lot? And I think the much more interesting questions are, do rivers have characteristic metabolic regimes and how are they changing? And how does that think about the role of river energetics in sustaining the biodiversity and the ecosystem processes that are critical to why we want to protect rivers in the first place? So I find the carbon cycling thing, I mean, useful, but kind of boring, honestly. And what's much more interesting is what's happening uh, to river systems as they're being altered, or as we're trying to manage and restore them, can we bring energetic regimes back into, this, into some semblance of what organisms that evolve there that we're trying to protect um, are used to? So do rivers have characteristic metabolic regimes? So we started doing this. Uh, postdoc Phil Savoy was a lead postdoc on our stream pulse project. Um, and he started to do a bunch of really cool uh, dynamic time series modeling um, to try and actually do sort of clustering analysis of what kinds of variability are we getting in these sort of annual patterns. So can we start to describe uh, big patterns? And the first uh, effort of that was for a subset of those 215 rivers for which we had multiple years of data. So we could look at you know, annual average patterns. And we began to see that the biggest divides were first canopy shading, those rivers on the top. This is the actual productivity, and this is the normalized. You can see the patterns a little bit better. But basically, if, your canopy, if you have a shaded canopy, um, you don't, nothing much happens, right? And if you don't have canopy shading, then you can have higher productivity. 
And then second split in each case was hydrologic disturbance. So when you're flashy, you have frequent high flows, number three and number two here, uh, not much happens, right? So you're basically uh, constrained by light uh, or limited by light and constrained by flow as the sort of major uh, categories of differentiation between these um, metabolic regimes. So we published this paper um, year before last from, uh, in PNAS from sort of the big outcome of, of seven years of study. So this is for hundreds of, of U.S. rivers for which we had annual metabolism patterns. And that same idea that came out in the first couple of years of our work has been borne out. Uh, it's a complicated figure, but hopefully I can walk you through. We basically took um, the entire data set, over 300 rivers, and we looked at the quartile. So if you look at the quartile with the highest light, that's up in the top left. We look at the quartile with the most flow variability here in the bottom right. We look at the quartile with the most stable flows and the quartile with the lowest light. And already you can see big differences, right? Like light matters <laughs> and flow matters, right? So you're going to get your highest productivity in the intersection between high light and stable flows. We call these bright and stable systems. Does that sound nice? And then you're going to be really, you're going to be not, you're going to be able to do very much in a dark and unstable system which has all kinds of connotations, but that makes sense to you, right? A dark and unstable system is not gonna have a lot of productivity. So we can begin to imagine that these are the big constraints, the big drivers. Interesting here, I know that here in Wakato and almost everywhere else in the world, we're thinking a lot about nutrient enrichment. There's not, a, there's not great data on nutrients from this data set, but where we have it, it seems like nutrients are gonna be a much more secondary or tertiary control. And instead, what I think we're gonna see is that these productivity regimes, the respiration regimes are big drivers of the nutrient concentration. So a system like this has, is doing very little work. It can't act on the nutrients that are being loaded to it. A system like the one on the top can absolutely act on that nutrient. So I think it's gonna be more the reverse that the energetic regimes are drivers of the nutrient regimes as opposed to the reverse. But of course, the more nutrients you add, you might imagine your capacity to take advantage of light goes up. So it might amplify, but not be the primary <clears throat> constrainer. That's, that's my hypothesis. I would say we don't have data to prove that yet, but everything that I've seen so far is consistent with that idea. So I think these energetic regimes are gonna be important for thinking about how we manage uh, river, uh, river nutrient loads once the nutrients are already in the river. Any questions about that? I see nodding. Nobody looks too mad about that idea. Okay. So then the big question is how are river metabolic regimes changing? We now have data to say, okay, we can put up these archetypes. We can imagine the kinds of regimes that most rivers are going to likely going to fall into. Can we change them? Can we use this either to understand rivers cha changing or uh, river management? Um, this was one of the great examples we used in our, our first paper from the project. Uh, this is from the member of Korea, Spain. Uh, and I think there was 16 years of data, eight before and eight after a wastewater treatment plant went in. Uh, and the black, so this is a kernel density plot, and it basically shows for eight years of data, mainly after the DR and GDP, and it's just made a contour plot, right? So the whole, all, almost all the data fit inside that 75th quartile. So those black lines show you where the data points sit for, um, before the wastewater treatment plan went in. You can see it had super high rates of ecosystem respiration. Um, and then once the wastewater treatment plan went in, the green lines, that compressed up to near the origin. So this might be kind of surprising to you, get to this nutrient thing as well. We tend to think about waste our tree plants putting lots of nitrogen and phosphorus in the system. They also put in a lot of organic carbon, really labile carbon. And so here, the big effect of the waste our tree plant going in is that we've reduced the amount of labile carbon that's coming in and we're seeing far less respiration. Not really much change in productivity at all um, in the system, which is pretty interesting. But the other thing I'll say is this fingerprint, this metabolic fingerprint as we call it, is an excellent, diagnosis of the fact that you have actually created a major change as a result of an intervention and what kinds of uh, um, solutes are coming in the system. So I'll show you another example. This is from my uh, PhD, former PhD student, Joanna Blaschek, she's now a faculty member in Nevada, Reno. Reno. We were working in urban systems uh, in uh, North Carolina, thinking about uh, watersheds that had similar amounts of impervious cover, but really different road densities. So here is like the watershed characteristics were quite similar to all, we're about 10% impervious cover, but they had really different uh, road and pipe densities and those road and pipe densities led to very different flashiness signatures for the stream hydrographs. So I'll just show you that for these six sites for which we had continuous metabolism, um, we had F1, our least flashy, F6, our most flashy. We don't have a seasonal uh, precipitation regime in North Carolina, it just kind of rains all the time and whether or not you get floods is a lot to do with pavement. So our flashiest system had a, basically a bed scouring flood roughly every seven days. That's a lot, right? 
Um, and then, uh, if we, and so this is the Richard Baker's flash yeast index. You can see that even though all these watersheds had really similar total impervious cover, the way it was configured and the way it was connected to the stream is quite different. And so what Joanna did was then we measured uh, daily productivity across uh, several years. And um, we, she, she looked at this in a, in, I think, a way that's kind of interesting when you're thinking about um, the effect of, instead of just looking just at rates, she looked at the, uh, the ability of the ecosystem to convert light into productivity, right? Because light regimes can be quite different between the systems. So if you take how much light is the system getting, getting and how much is it able to convert into productivity, and that's what this shows. So the top three are least flashy systems, the bottom three are most flashy systems, the x-axis is showing the amount of light reaching the channel surface, and then the y-axis is the daily rates of productivity. And what you can see is that our really flashy systems, it doesn't really matter how much light you're getting, you're not creating almost any productivity from those systems. Whereas in our less flashy systems, um, you're gonna actually see a response to light. So this suggests this major constraint of flow disturbances that basically keep knocking biomass back, either through scour or through burial, so that you can't actually have the system taking advantage of light. So again, just a, a, I think a, a really vivid example of how hydrologic disturbance can be a primary constraint. So you're gonna reach a point at which the bed is moving too much for the system to really do any, any uh, biological work. Okay, so now I'm gonna take you to what I think is my, our best climate change story to date. And it's really limited because as I said, there's one annual metabolism pattern in the whole world before 1990. Um, and so we went back to that same system, but of course it suffers from anywhere we have like two data points, right? one in 1969 and one in 2019. So this is, a, again, we're back to Charlie Hall's figure from New Hope Creek. Um, it's a great fish paper for fish people. If you've never read it, it's really awesome. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but it's really cool. Um, and my student, Alice Carter, went out and repeated the annual metabolism for the same stream in the same locations. Um, I'm showing you here what's happened to the climate in the system over the intervening uh, 50 years. So in uh, 1969, uh, air temperatures were a good uh, four degrees cooler. have gone up about 0.4 degrees C per decade. Uh, and then this is water temperature, which I think is really remarkable. 2019 in black, uh, red is 1969. You can see in 1969, Hope Creek froze during the winter at ice. In the winter time, uh, when Alice was doing it, it, it never dropped below five degrees. And most of the time it was about 10 degrees hotter during the winter. This is a um, almost fully forested watershed, uh, pr mostly protected inside of the Duke uh, Experimental Research Forest. So very little land use change. This is almost exclusively climate change. So much warmer temperatures, you see that throughout the year, but particularly dramatic in the winter time. And if you think about how important leaves are to fuel the system, you can kind of imagine what this means in terms of the energetics of winter time. I'm, I'm forecasting a little bit. The other thing that's happened is we've had change in flows. Um, so this just shows the annual precipitation. There's not been really any change, but the number of extreme events has gone up, that middle on graph, and the number of days with no precipitation has gone up. So we've got higher highs and lower lows that have been happening in hydrograph over time. And so if we compare those two years, uh, the biggest things to see are those peak storm events are higher in the 2019 than anything that was measured in Charlie Hall's day. And I think that's consistent with what the sort of long-term record suggests. And the other thing is if you look at late October, uh, we went to a, a no-flow period during that time. And not much evidence that that was happening very regularly back in the 60s. So now we can compare um, what the uh, estimates of Charlie Hall back in 1969 looked like versus the estimates that um, Alice got uh, in, in 2019. And what's happened is that the system has become both uh, more productive and more heterotrophic. Um, so the 2019 is in gray and uh, uh, 1969 is in red. And we've seen an increase in both. Um, massive, I think the, one of the most interesting thing is that if you look in gray here, the gray um, 2019 versus the red 1969, what you're seeing is like really high respiration throughout the entire winter, whereas it's mostly uh, shut down in 1969. And I think that makes sense. It's, ten, it's five to 10 degrees hotter for months in the winter than it was before. You've just added a huge amount of leaf litter. So you've allowed the system sort of chew through that leaf litter for many more months than it would have in the past. And I think that's quite interesting. If you think about the life cycle of organisms that are tied to leaf litter as the primary energy source. 
Also, the dominant metabolic window is shifted from the spring to the fall or even the winter, resulting in a net shift towards heterotrophy. So you've got, it's more productive, but the heterotrophic increases even more. So it's even more heterotrophic than it is in the past. Mm -hmm. I think, so I think what's interesting here is you've got a shift in timing, you've got a shift in magnitude, uh, and you've got a shift in the net uh, carbon dynamics of the system. Now, I'll be careful to say, of course, these are two data points, but they literally are the only two data points we have where you can compare things that are more than 10 years apart. Um, and it is at least consistent with what you'd expect from first principles, that a warming winter stream is going to have uh, a really different um, dynamics than, than its cooler counterpart. So my student, Johnny Behrens, is finishing up the spring, uh, sort of piggybacked on top of this and wanted to compare the dynamics of New York Creek um, uh, metabolism, which we're just showing you, to the dynamics of the adjacent Ellaby Creek watershed, which drains most of the city of Durham, which is where Duke University is. Um, it's about 70% um, developed versus New York Creek being less than 5% developed. And so he went out and measured uh, metabolism continuously uh, in forest of the New York Creek site. And so it looked the same, it's just that it starts a little bit at different times. So you've got your spring peak, uh, and not much going on the rest of the year. Uh, this is the Ellerby Creek at the point where the watersheds are exactly the same size, but a wastewater treatment plant is coming in, so heavily subsidized uh, by nutrients and organic matter. And you can see that this system looks a lot more like Forest Oilinger's site in Switzerland, right? It's flashy and enriched. And it's getting this sort of boom bust in activity dynamics that you might expect, even though the amount of light and the amount of organic matter coming into the system are, uh, the amount of leaflet coming into the system are almost exactly the same. The stormwater site is about halfway up the urban watershed. It doesn't have a wastewater uh, coming in and it's extremely flashy. So the bed is moving roughly every seven days and almost nothing is happening there. But it doesn't have a spring peak, right? It's just sort of like, if you have a couple, if you have a couple of weeks without high flows, you get productivity. What's cool about what Johnny's been doing is that he was measuring metabolism, but his actual questions were about the production of bugs and the system or secondary production. So once a month um, for a whole year, he went out and looked at benthic biomass and did all the measurements to be able to do biomass production in these systems. I'll remind you, sorry, that the wastewater system is about twice as productive as the forested counterpart. You might expect that subsidy of organic matter and nutrients and productivity might lead to higher bug production, but in fact, it does not. So here in the forest side up on the top, the wastewater side in the middle, and the stormwater side on the bottom. And what's actually really interesting is the wastewater and stormwater, both urban streams are producing very little secondary production at all. And it's not very diverse. It's almost entirely uh, coronamid midges and uh, really tolerant hydrocycid caddis flies, whereas the forest stream is producing uh, Predominantly philopotamid uh, caddis flies, lots of grazing mayflies, uh, completely different sorts of dynamics, right? And a really different, um, really different identity of what's coming out. I think there's 22 families coming out in the forested site and less than seven in the two urban sites. So massive differences in diversity, massive differences in timing of emergence. Uh, total differences in secondary production. I'll put that into a simpler sort of annualized graph. Um, in green is the estimate of uh, total annual production, and brown is the total net metabolism, the total heterotrophic productivity. The orange bars show you the amount of secondary production, grams per meter squared per year. And what we see is that you, although you have uh, almost twice as much production in the wastewater site as the forested site, you get, you get half of the secondary production. So the efficiency with which you can convert that basal metabolic energy is really um, constrained in these urban sites, which is, which is pretty fascinating, right? So it doesn't matter how much you produce if you can, if it's constantly interrupted. Now that could be because the productivity is interrupted. It could be because the productivity is of a less palatable algal format. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, or it could be that you're actually just constantly washing any attempted uh, you know, uh, larva that has a long life cycle that just can't stay in the system. All these things could be true, uh, but we expect that the energetic regime is a part of the story uh, for the reduction in biomass. So all of this is coming together into this idea that I would really like to see us adding an energetic component to how we think about uh, changes in river ecosystems and the support of food webs and biodiversity. So we've long thought about flow and light and heat and physical regimes and how they individually drive the ability of sensitive taxa to persist. But I think each of those physical drivers also has an energetic consequence, right? Or an energetic echo of those things, which itself has direct effects 
on um, the, the basically the magnitude of production that could even be possible, the constraints on the food web, as well as the timing. And so I think if we add metabolic regimes to these physical regimes, we're likely to learn a lot more about what is going to drive the ability of a river to support um, consumers. We've been trying to put this into sort of a theoretical context. Um, and instead of just thinking about a reach, thinking about this at network scale, so I'm going to take you into some um, theoretical uh, modeling work that I've been doing with Enrico Bertuzzo, who is a phenomenal um, river network ecosystem modeler um, from the University of Venice. We've been taking data we've gathered from the Stream Pulse project to, to do sort of realistic estimates of productivity, hydrologic impacts, um, real data from MODIS for litter inputs, and building a, a model that sort of says, okay, we should be able to estimate for any segment, given how much light there is, how uh, much bed scour there is, and how much leaf litter is provided, what amount is available to feed grazers, collectors, and shredders. And so we've actually connected an ecosystem energetic model to a food web model. In this um, modeling exercise, and then we're, we're playing with climate change. So in this modeling exercise, we estimate the amount of light that's hitting every node in a, in a hypothetical river network. And it's really simple, like smaller streams get less light, bigger streams gets more light. And we estimate litter fall, and this is based on using sort of modus data. So again, uh, narrower streams get a higher litter fall input, and wider streams get a, a lower litter fall input. The important thing is that this is the same in all of the scenarios. We use four different scenarios where we actually manipulated um, the uh, hydrograph and temperature. So we either made the system significantly flashier, amplified the, amplified the highs, lowered the lows, and then we increased the temperature uh, by six degrees C, median temperature. So, and then we did that, the cross. So we've got a basement scenario, we've got a flashier scenario, we've got a warmer scenario, and we've got a hotter and flashier scenario. And then we can actually estimate for every single one of those segments what's happening. And then each segment is hydrologically connected to all downstream segments. So you have basically the capacity for things to happen in the reach or for materials to be transported downstream or for organisms to be transported downstream. And so now we can take what we think we're beginning to understand about a segment scale ecosystem and convert that into a network scale story. So I'm gonna show a couple graphs like this. Um, the, first, this is showing you like for uh, going from headwaters down to the main stem, where is, of course, particular organic matter, where is fine particular organic matter, where is algae for four different scenarios. Um, the two solid lines are the flashier scenarios. Red is always hotter, and the small um, black line is the reference conditions. The biggest story here is that when you have flashier systems, stuff gets pushed downstream, right? So of course, particular organic matter leaves fall in the stream, but if it's a flashier system, they don't stay. So they tend to get pushed downstream. The same thing is true for fine particular organic matter. You're moving materials, but they're being moved downstream. Uh, and then for algae, I think one of the biggest uh, stories is that if you have bed moving flows, um, you're going to push a lot of the productive systems to being unproductive, and your highest productivity is going to occur downstream. So we have a massive reduction in total productivity as a result of flashier flows. We can then take that and take the consumers of those three resources and find that, if, and they basically look exactly like what's happening to sea palm. So if you move the leaf litter, the big organic matter downstream, the shredders also have to move downstream. These are the stone flies and shredding caddis flies. If you move the fine particulates downstream, you also move the collector gatherers, your uh, black fly larvae, your net spinning caddis flies. Um, and if you move algae downstream, your grazers also are gonna be reduced. So on the top there, you can see the biomass. And so you can see that both warming and flashiness reduce the total amount of shredder, collector, or grazer biomass that can be reduced at the network scale, and pretty significantly in each case. And so we can look then at the network scale. This is a map now of primary consumer productivity. All three uh, groups from the baseline situation, the warming situation, the flashier situation, and the warmer and flashier. And then that's converted into numbers and if you look at the, the right-hand side of this, this, is the whole network scale estimates. So what we're estimating from this model using sort of first principles and real data parameterized, real parameter data coming from our research, we're seeing an almost 70% reduction in the total amount of biomass being produced at the network scale in the warmer and last year scenario. Now, we're never going to be able to measure this in the real world because we're never going to go to a whole network where nothing is happening but climate change, right? So we're going to see these same trends. What, the, what this 
theoretical modeling suggests is that climate change is likely going to be exacerbating any patterns that we are seeing that are resulting from sediment pollution or uh, hypoxia, right, or flashy flows due to storm waters. The other thing I would say is it is going to make it harder to mitigate or restore because this underlying chronic change is changing the rule set even as we're trying to sort of remove some of those primary drivers. So my suggestion, and of course, this is theoretical, but I think it makes a ton of sense if you begin to think about it. It, it really follows from first principles, but this may be a really important driver of the dramatic declines in um, aquatic invertebrate richness and density that we see. This is a paper that came out just last year from a work group I was a part of. Samantha Rumschlag uh, was the lead author. It was an amazing compilation of thousands and thousands of long-term uh, aquatic invertebrate data sets from across the US showing really sharp declines in the density. Richness increase is really interesting, but as I was saying to Samantha, the title, which science advances would let her use, it's a wormier, warmer world. Most of the richness was in worms. Um, all kinds of coronavirus and diptera and not, not sensitive taxa. So we see the sensitive tax emissions um, declining and a lot of real tolerant organisms increasing. So over the past 27 years, streams across the United States have seen decreases in the total density of macroinvertebrates everywhere. And urban and agricultural streams have lost very few disturbance sensitive taxa they once have and have gained disturbance tolerant taxa. So this sort of land use change together with climate change are likely a, a part of the story and they're both gonna be really important to the declines that we see over time. Okay, so I guess the main takeaways that I have from today's talk is that it's not possible to measure annual metabolism consistently across many rivers. And I hope I've made a case to you, it's totally worth doing um, because it gives us a new set of constraints. It tells us a lot about what the rivers, you know, uh, biomass is doing um, and the capacity of the system to produce animal biomass and to uh, actually affect nutrient regimes. There are characteristic metabolic regimes in rivers. And I think that's quite useful to think about what you should be seeing based on the light and hydrologic regime that a system is um, um, subjected to. And climate change, land use change, and pollution are all altering these metabolic regimes in ways that I think we are beginning to understand uh, and ways that we might actually begin to use the energetic regime to see if, in fact, we're able to reverse some of those trends. I would say at this point, the consequences of freshwater biodiversity are unknown, but I think we have good uh, theoretical and empirical data suggests that they're going to be uh, quite important. And so the, the big question that I have and something I have to be working on for the next couple of decades is how do we incorporate our emerging understanding of the energetic regimes of rivers into our management and monitoring of freshwater resources. And the last thing I'll say is that one of the big things we've done with the Strain Pulse Project is to try to make a community data platform where we help people turn sensor data into metabolic um, SMEs. Uh, we help people clean up their messy sensor data and all of our data is really available on the web for anybody to play with and use. And so there's a gorgeous uh, data visualization, visualization platform that I strongly encourage you to, to check out. Um, it's been awesome that we did this with nine, uh, nine initial PIs funded to collect DO data. And I think the Stream Pulse site now includes data from more than 150 uh, contributors. So a lot of people, if you give them the tools to make it easier to clean your data, will be happy to share their data. So this is kind of a, a fun um, outcome on the data sharing front. So thank you very much for your attention. And I really look forward to uh, questions today or conversations uh, during my visit. Appreciate it. <laughs> Okay, do we have any questions in the room? Feel free to raise your hand. Um, or questions on Zoom, please raise your hand as well. Um, Frank first, sorry. Okay. Oh, you're calling, okay. I'll start answer. Well, let me go first. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I appreciate your comment about like relating uh, metabolism, drivers of metabolism to like the Waikato region and nutrient pollution yeah. being a major issue here. And now, one of the other things that I've just kind of noticed driving around, around the landscape is they're extremely turbid as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if your group has thought about not only like a uh, light that might reach the surface of the stream, but the effect on um, turbidity and light availability. Yeah, throughout. turbidity is, you wish you had more data on it, right? So we, we have great models for us. We've created models to estimate from satellite data and modus based um, canopy data. We can actually estimate light to any stream segment in the world, but only the surface, right? So the turbidity part obviously is a huge thing. And if you've got a turbid system, 
you won't see any productivity, if, even if there's plenty of light hitting the system. And that's one reason we've started looking at light use efficiency. So rather than looking at productivity alone, we say, well, how much productivity is being produced per unit light? Mm -hmm. Turbid rivers are going to have a really low or no light use efficiency. And that's one way to get around that problem. But yeah, huge, huge constraint on data availability. Thanks. Yeah, um, the modeling here is really cool. Um, I was wondering, um, do you, what sort of scenarios were you using for the, the changing environment with the warm and flashier systems? Because I'm wondering, you know, it's like a shifting baseline, basically. If you're thinking about restoration, and you're trying to get a system to return to permanent. You're trying to rehabilitate it, basically, to a desired state. But, you know, climate change is happening, and it's just shifting the goalposts um, further and further. So, you know, we might be looking back at in time and saying, well, you know, it's not returning back to that state, but that's because the goalposts are shifting. But I was wondering, you know, what sort of rate of change might you know, be expected? You know, like the goalposts are moving, but how quickly are they moving? So, you know, maybe that was something you considered in your models, like what scenarios would yeah. constitute a warmer, flashier world? Um, I mean, that's a great question. I, to I totally don't know the answer to it. Yeah, it's, no, important, it's important conversations to be having, right? Like the baseline is moving in ways that we don't fully understand. But if we're trying to go back to a situation um, that we've arbitrarily picked 1975, right? That's what we want to go back to. But mean in the meantime, the winter temperatures have gone up by 10 degrees. We're probably not going to get there, right? And so you know, that's an interesting one. Like maybe then we focus on the mechanism. So the big change is that the system, the rest of this time of organic matter inputs is lower because you've got this engine. So do we create ways to retain more of that, right? Can we, you know, you can imagine we can play with physical and, um, and chemical shifts in a way that might counter the mechanistic change. I'm a, I mean, I've done a ton of work on restoration in my, in my, um, in my 25 years of my career. And most of the time it's, it's really hard to go back in any way. Um, and we're picking an arbitrary deadline. I would love to see us instead saying, what are we trying to design for? Right. So if we're really concerned that the, the system is, is just not supporting as many animals, well, why is that, right? Can we focus on the energetic regime instead? Can we think about ways we could um, increase the amount of storage of organic matter or increase the resilience of algae, right, in a system where you're trying to do that? So I think, that, you know, getting into the mechanism as opposed to the physical structure um, is probably one, one good way to go. Um, but most importantly, these are conversations we should be having, right? Yeah. 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 Thanks. Great. Are there, are there any more questions? Any questions on Zoom? Feel free to just um, unmute your mic if you have any questions. No one has so, any questions. No, I, I do have a question. So this is probably um, <laughs> with this question. So do you think that turbidity is then what drives the the relatively uh, the fact that there are very few river systems that have low light availability and stable flow. What's the what's what do you think is driving that? Very few. So, oh, there are very few systems that USGS or researchers work on that have oh. high flow stability. That could be a so, sampling bias. It's probably sampling bias, right? And I don't know how much. Yeah, I don't know how many. Um, have focused on turbidity. There certainly are, I mean, I know in our data set from USGS, there's a number of southern turbid rivers. Um, and you can sometimes see like the productivity regime, you've got a flood event and then a long time before it recovers. And I think often that's in systems where you get a lot of turbid, like a lot of sediment um, uh, movement. But some systems we just know they're black water or they're turbid and they're kind of off the charts. And I, I think it's like akin to when we think about lakes, lakes, you know, oligotrophic, eutrophic, and then dystrophic. It's almost like we need this other category of river systems where it's the, the turbidity or the color of organic matter that would be a big constraint on what can happen. Yeah. Great. I think we have something coming through. Oh, I'm here till March 6th. <laughs> so, Andrew, first. Um, Thanks, that was a really interesting talk. I should say I'm not a freshwater stream. That's okay. But, um, I do a fair bit with food webs. And I guess I was just kind of noticing an interesting trend with, I think, was it the Hope Stream data from Jim Hall and even the more recent yeah. data from 2019? Looks like there's this sort of shift toward kind of browning of these food webs if you have, you know, relatively similar productivity levels, but massive increases in. And respiration. 
And that's kind of what you'd expect, right? Warming might actually enhance the microbial um, respiration at the expense of animal biomass production. Do you think? Or inefficiencies, right? Trophic inefficiencies is another one I'm really interested in. Right. So I guess like in, in some way there's a bit of potential that that could actually be stabilizing food webs in those systems if it's you know much more sort of ground energy channel dominated and, and you have you know I guess more well yeah less dynamic basal resources not necessarily so impacted by top-down effects is that something that I think okay so you're saying so if you if you have like a if you have the capacity to to work through that organic matter for many more months after its delivery then that could be stabilizing and I guess then the open question for me would be are the aquatic invertebrates is their life history set up to do that, right? Are they able to adjust their life history timing, which might be set to flow events or might be set to day lengths or things like that, right? So do you actually get that change? And what concerns me, and I think we see this in a lot of data sets, is what happens is that organisms that can complete their life cycle quickly and can have multiple generations per year, capitalize, and microbes win, right? So what you would want to say from a biodiversity sort of food web stability perspective is that energy can now be used throughout the winter. Who's using it? Right. And if it's a bunch of microbes and we basically enhance the microbial loop, right, then that actually isn't that isn't actually sustaining animal production. Uh, it's just increasing microbial respiratory losses. I don't know the answer to that, right? Because I don't we don't have any secondary production data from back in the late 1960s. There, there is fish data, but I'm not I, so if anybody knows anyone who wants to come do an amazing um, um, uh, study of fish, I think it'd be fascinating. So Charlie did fish. Secondary production, but he didn't do bugs. Um, yeah, I guess more of this and a, and a broader theme is what we get challenged with here is can we use metabolism as a metric of stream health, or is it just too variable across systems, flows, light availabilities, turbidities? Um, that's the big barrier for well, at least within MIWA for us trying to increase work in that space is that it it seems to be you're not very on the ground. It's very theoretical. It's the comments we get. I think it would be more like uh, akin to the way we thought about flow regimes, where it's not like there's not an ideal metabolic regime. Right? It's what was the metabolic regime? How's it been altered? And can we move it back? Right? Or what's the reference condition metabolic regime that you're trying? You know that what's the closest analog site that's experiencing the same? flow regime, but isn't got the same turbidity regime, for example, right? And you certainly wouldn't want to be aiming for, I think sometimes people talk about energetics in a really oversimplified way that's dangerous, right? It's not like having a super high productivity system is awesome. That's an algal right? <laughs> yes. So we, it's not it's not like you're trying to maximize the energetics. It's that you're trying to achieve, and that's why the regime is so important. You're trying to achieve a magnitude and a timing that looks like um, the past or looks like the best case scenario in the basin that you're working in, right? Um, that's realistic. And so I think it's it's more the timing than it is the magnitude. Yeah, so you need previous data sets. So it's sort of hard. Or you have data that change. For the best case scenario, like if you're working in a third order segment of the Waikato and there's another third order segment in a catchment that's rel relatively protected, what does that look like, right? And, and how different are they from each other? So I think that the comparison we did from our urban and our forested catchment are pretty interesting. It's the same size watershed, right? It's the same topography, the same geology, completely different productivity patterns, largely because of the sort of massive organic subsidies and massive hydrologic subsidy, which are leading to these boom-bust dynamics. And I think if we could remove those boom-bust dynamics and bring back a spring peak, right, then that actually would be pretty good evidence that we've, we've solved a lot of issues. <clears throat> so I think it's, it's almost like an emergent property of all the underlying things that you're doing to the system, right? So you could say if you're aiming for that, you'd actually have to accomplish a lot of mechanistic shifts in the thermal regime, the hydrologic regime, the nutrient regime. It's an integrator. It's an integrator, absolutely. Yep. And easier than secondary production, <laughs> which is really hard. Hey, good to see you. Hey, good to see you too. Uh, thanks for the presentation. One thing I was wondering about, um, I was thinking about Peter Raymond's pulse shunt work. Yes. And, and when you're looking at like stream networks and in response to, you know, or changes in stream flashiness, and if you're looking at or disturbance events, you're looking at individual sites, how much of that, the observed change that you see in response to a disturbance event um, actually is change that's occurring there versus you're just seeing 
the, the metabolic signature of a different location upstream, right? Depending on the size of the, the rate of the flow. And maybe it doesn't matter ultimately, but it's just trying to unpack what's the cause of it. If it's changes that are current there, or if it's just you're sort of integrating different reaches or lines, you know, different distances upstream in your signal, um, depending on the flashiness. And then also because flashiness might correspond to like the depth and the amount of cans can cover the size. So how, how do you disentangle? Some of that. It absolutely does. So the model set up so that you know flashness in the headwaters has a lot bigger impact than flashiness. Yeah, which is probably lower light to begin with, right? Absolutely. Right. Right. Be so. absolutely. Yeah. so I, I mean, I, I keep thinking about it like we're, uh, a lot of what warming and uh, flashier flows are doing is reducing the resonance time of autotrophs and organic matter, right? So you just have less time to act on things, and you're pushing that. You're you're having more. And so. At, a lot of what we did was look at hydrologic export of things become and respiratory export of things becomes a bigger loss term under the hotter and flashier scenario, right? So that means that, you know, in most river systems, what does that mean? We're shoving a lot of stuff into reservoirs in my part of the world, right? Um, where it's maybe it's going to be buried, right? That might be great from a carbon burial standpoint, but not that great for producing aquatic organisms, right? So if you're, that's why I really want to make sure we're not thinking of purely about the carbon budget, but we're thinking about how do we sustain the food webs of rivers, right? Um, how do we sustain the diversity of organisms in these systems? I think this has major implications for that because you also don't have the same organisms living in a main stem large river as you do in the headwaters, right? A lot of the diversity in river systems is held in the headwaters. And one of the main outcomes of that modeling exercise is that headwaters are gonna be starved. Under, under these scenarios, under sort of realistic scenarios. Um, if you put into in context with that too, that most of them are dry as well, they're just, it's hard. It's gonna be harder and harder to make a living in a headwater. Um, so I, that's kind of, I guess what I would say is sort of the main take home is that you're, you're changing the rule set. And one of the things we explore in that paper is that if you're trying to study climate change, what you think is happening will be really contingent on where you are in the network for those very reasons, right? Whether or not you're in the headwater and you're having everything lost from the system, or you can have other places that are being subsidized. And so that's gonna look really different in terms of what the long-term patterns. Okay, uh, we should wrap up here. Tim, would you mind coming in? Uh, yeah. doing that Thank you everyone, I enjoyed talking at you. Before I close um, this part, of Presentation down. Just an open invitation. This Friday morning, I'm going to get one of the uh, one of the cousins, Les Tutau. He does the uh, Tahuere Maori tourism walking sculpture art tour, and he talks about uh, this is in Hamilton. He talks about the importance of the Waikato River uh, to the iwi. So he's the son of uh, Cheryl. Shirley Tutel, who's our Kuya Kaimato here at the university. So this Friday, um, Les is going to uh, do this walking tour. So uh, Emily's going to jump on it. But if anyone else wants to uh, go along and go on the walking tour, it's about an hour, hour and a half. It's quite informative. Charles has been on it. We get a lot of our visiting uh, researchers and academics go on it as well. So just learn about the significance of the sculptures, but also the art and, and the importance of the river. So if anyone wants to go along on that, come to me after this and just give me your name and I'll put you down on the list. There is a cost to it, but I'll cover that cost. Yeah. Okay, if you're interested. Kati uh, te O te mātauranga, a whakauranga o te ao, whakauranga te tai ao, a whakauranga o te tā awa. I re 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 hau, pai mā. Kia ora, everyone. Kia ora. Oh, yes, okay. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.